Well, thank you all for coming. It's uh, a pleasure to be here in uh, Queensland and uh, especially being on this campus because it's a stunning campus. I was telling uh, Graham and uh, Phil that I came on the River Cat and that's uh, a beautiful introduction. But uh, I'm talking today about uh, uh, manipulating and phenotyping nitrogen insufficiency in cereals. Uh, it's really a, a seminar in three parts. Uh, so there's the, uh, a bit about the, the nitrate uptake work that we've done, uh, a bit about phenotyping differences in nitrogen uptake, but then I'm also going to give a bit of an introduction to uh, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility for those that uh, don't know much about that. Hopefully you all know about it, but uh, just in case. So the nitrate uptake in cereals. This is uh, work that uh, I started doing at uh, the ACPFG in Adelaide. Um, it's a long-term collaboration with uh, Pioneer in the US, uh, and most of it's been done by uh, myself and uh, Darren Plett. This is still ongoing. We've got uh, an ARC uh, grant uh, to do this. So increasing nitrogen sufficiency. Uh, hopefully all of you uh, understand uh, about uh, why we want to in increase nitrogen use efficiency. You've got uh, good people on the campus working on this. Uh, but you know, for those that don't know, you know, there's a vast amount of nitrogen that's applied uh, to crops annually, you know, over 100 million tonnes. And 60% of that is applied to cereals. Uh, cereals are relatively poor at capturing that uh, nitrate fertiliser, and that has a huge environmental impact. Um, you know, in terms of greenhouse impact, um, it's about 2% of the world's energy is used to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere for nitrogen fertilisers. Um, so that's a huge impact. Uh, nitrous oxide emissions from nitrous oxides emitted from uh, crops uh, are another major greenhouse input. Um, there's a huge contamination of water. If you uh, look in the US, sort of in the, in the maize growing areas, You've got uh, millimolar concentrations of nitrate in the groundwater, and that's from uh, you know fertilizer that's not been used, and you know that washes out to sea. You've got uh, you know that's not a pointer. Oh, you've got uh, you know algal blooms. You know the the Mississippi Delta each year has uh, a massive dead zone formed because of algal blooms from nitrogen fertilizer. So it's a major issue that's uh, starting to be addressed. Uh, in Europe and Australia, but uh, sadly, it's not making, uh, they're not getting that far with it in the US. <coughs> so, there are multiple components of NUE. This is a whole, this is a list of definitions that uh, Alan Good uh, published in uh, 2004, which has been based on a, a range of other papers. But uh, the ones of interest for me here are the um, uptake efficiency and utilization efficiency. So, the uptake efficiency is how well the plant gets the nitrogen from the soil. Uh, the utilisation efficiency is how well the plant can use the nitrogen once it's in the plant. We're focused on the uptake efficiency, or we have been focused on the uptake efficiency. And that's because, as I said before, cereals are quite poor at capturing nitrogen fertiliser. Um, the, uh, uh, there's been a couple of meta-analyses meta done um, and they've shown that uh, only 40 to 50 percent of the applied N is actually taken up by a cereal crop. So we've been interested in how we can improve that uh, uptake efficiency and uh, you know what is limiting the uptake of nitrogen. So you know where we set out to define the nitrate uptake system in cereals. You know, why nitrate? Because Nitrate is the predominant form of uh, nitrogen available in uh, cropping soils. There is ammonium there, um, but uh, you know, a range of studies have shown that uh, um, the ammonium concentration is only about 10% of the nitrate. So if the nitrate varies, which it does throughout the season, then uh, the ammonium varies with that. So it's about 10%. And we have, that is important, to, and we've done some work on that. But uh, nitrate's the, the main source of nitrogen. So uh, we wanted to define that cereal uptake system. You know, how does it respond to nitrogen availability? How does it change throughout the life cycle? You know, and ideally, you know, how can it be modified to improve nitrogen uptake? Or what do we look for in plants that uh, have higher uptake efficiency? 
So in terms of nitrate uptake by plants, most of what we know is based on work with Arabidopsis. We're starting to move outside of Arabidopsis now, but uh, you know, it, it's still the easiest plant to work with. So uh, you know, the basic research is done in that. So there are three uh, families of NRT transporters that uh, are involved. Uh, the NRT1, which has now been renamed the MPF family, and there are about 13, although it keeps being added to, uh, transporters that definitely transport nitrate, and they're low uh, and dual affinity transporters. One of them in particular, NRT1.1, uh, is a dual affinity transporter, and that changes from low to high affinity based on a phosphorylation event. Uh, that one is also thought to be a transceptor, so it's uh, sensing nitrate as well as transporting. The transporting may actually be uh, a minor role compared to the, the sensing. Uh, the other is the, the NRT2 family. They're high affinity transporters and there are seven known members. Um, the NRT3s are not transporters at all. They don't have that classic sort of 12 membrane domain that the others have, um, but they're important because the NRT2s don't transport nitrate unless they're in a complex with the NRT3s. Uh, and there's two members in there in Arabidopsis. So uh, we knew that uh, for Arabidopsis, but uh, we didn't know anything about uh, the cereal. So we started off with some bioinformatic work, uh, looking at uh, the published genomes of uh, the monocots and dicots. So we had uh, the NRT1s and NRT2s. The NRT1s mapped out fairly similarly, uh, so that was uh, convenient, but uh, what was interesting was that the NRT2s, the, uh, the Arabidopsis transporters are up here and uh, the serial ones are out uh, here. So there was this big dichotomy in terms of the, uh, uh, the NRT2s between uh, the monocots and dicots. So using all that uh, knowledge, you know, we knew what all those transporters were, we wanted to know what they were doing. So uh, this is a study that we did uh, in hydroponics with uh, Gas Bay Flint, which is uh, a small stature maze with a, a short life cycle, life cycle. So we used it because you know, these two plants were planted at the same time. That's B73, that's the, the standard maze that uh, was uh, the first maze to be uh, sequenced. And uh, you know, that's Gas Bay Flint, which is flowering there. So being a small stature, it, uh, you can do uh, you know, experiments like we've done here, which is a major hydroponics experiment. We grew a lot of them at uh, two concentrations of nitrate and did a whole lot of harvest along the way. So biomass, uh, the uptake capacity, uh, transcript levels. <coughs> we did some microarray work, which I'll talk about. We also did uh, amino acids and uh, all the nitrogen assimilation enzyme activities. Um, we were a bit disappointed when we first uh, analyzed the results. So the first results we could see were the biomass results. So in terms of the, uh, um, the, the total biomass and the grain yield, there was no difference between 0.5 and 2.5, which we were, you know, oh no, we've got it wrong. But uh, then we looked at uh, the uptake capacity. So this was measured using N15 at uh, 100 micromolar nitrate, and that uh, gives you an idea of how hungry the plant is. Um, and we saw huge differences between the, the low concentration plants in red and the high concentration plants in blue. So it would appear that uh, the plants in low concentration ramped up their uptake capacity to be able to meet the demand that they've got. And they were able to do that successfully, and we didn't see a difference in their their, either their biomass or their grain yield. But what was also interesting was that uh, even at the higher concentration, the plants had uh, significant uh, high affinity transport capacity and for both of them, it changed over time. If you look at the transcript levels, these are the, the main transporters there. So you've got uh, the NRT2s at the top, NRT3s here, and down the bottom, the, the low affinity transporters, the NRT1s. Now, the ones that were nitrate responsive were the NRT2s. So chiefly, uh, the top there, 2.1, 2.2, and 2.5. Only one of the uh, um, low affinity transporters was nitrate responsive, 
and that was NRT 1.5, which is thought to be involved in transport of nitrate from the roots to the shoots. But uh, there's two lines that I've drawn down both of these graphs, and that's the, the peaks and uptake capacity that you've got there. And you can see that uh, you had uh, peaks in the transcript levels of the NRT2s at uh, the same time when you're having peaks in uh, the uptake capacity. So it would appear that uh, the, uh, the differences in uptake capacity and the changes over time are due to uh, those NRT2s. They're the ones that are responding. Now, we, that was all steady state. We also did uh, some playing around. So at uh, two time points, at day 15 and day 22, we, uh, we uh, change plants from high concentration nitrate to low concentration. And you can see the uptake capacity here. This is the uptake capacity of those high concentration plants. We've changed them at this point from here and then, you know, two days later, we've got these major increases in their uptake capacity. So they've responded really quickly. We see, if you look at NRT 2.1 and 2.2, um, this is where you were beforehand. You've got a, a major increase in uh, the transcript levels in response. However, you had a, you had a big change in the, uh, the, the flux capacity before you had a change in the transcript levels. So uh, it wasn't uh, based on transcription. So we came up with a model of uh, the, the maize response to nitrate um, demand in that uh, in, <coughs> in black, you've got the actual uptake capacity. In uh, red, you've got the transcript levels and blue, the protein. So we think that uh, there's post-translational and uh, transcriptional control. So the first thing the plant does when it's got demand is that it uses uh, the latent uh, uptake capacity that's there. When that's not enough, then you have that transcriptional uh, event. And uh, we've been working since then to uh, try and validate uh, this model. We think it works, but uh, it's a lot more complicated uh, than we at first thought. So the NRT2s would appear to be doing all the hard work in responding to um, demand. And we wanted to know what uh, other genes were involved uh, in that response. Ideally, we want to know the plants that uh, are regulating the NRT2s. And uh, so for this, we had uh, tissue samples from that experiment. At seven time points, we ran them across a, a 44K microarray, which at the time was, uh, was you know, fairly good, but uh, uh, we've moved on since then and are doing RNA-seq. But uh, this data set uh, has been quite instructive for us. This is the... Uh, the size of these uh, balls represents uh, uh, the total number of nitrate responsive um, probe sets. So, you know, you can see that uh, you had at day 11, day 18, and day 29, you had uh, major transcriptional events. So that's nitrate responsive. At the other time points, you've got uh, a limited response. If you look at uh, day 11 and 29, they're dominated by uh, um, root um, differential probe sets. So uh, red is uh, 2.5 higher than 0.5, yellow is uh, 0.5 higher than uh, um, 2.5. So uh, day 11, day 29, it's dominated by root processes. At day 18, it's dominated by um, shoot processes. But major differences uh, across the life cycle. In terms of uh, the types of genes that are in there, day 11, it was dominated by transcription regulation. This is just based on GO analysis. Uh, day 18, it was uh, RNA ribosome processes, and uh, day 29, nitrogen metabolism. So we're interested in uh, the sorts of uh, <coughs> patterns that we saw in transcription. And uh, you know, most of them, most of the genes fitted into uh, this initial cluster here, which had, uh, you know, almost 12,000 probe sets, and uh, that this major cluster here, uh, there's not much you can see from that. But uh, the thing for us was that uh, the second component there, 
which is uh, this cluster here, uh, showed the two peaks that uh, we saw in uh, the transcription of the NRT2s. And uh, more importantly, uh, our NRT2s were in there. So we wanted to know what uh, was in that cluster. That's another way of looking at it. That's uh, a heat map of uh, those 98 genes in the cluster. So you can see that uh, these green tracks here, uh, you only see in the low concentration routes. You don't see it in the high concentration routes or at all in the shoots. And as I said, uh, you know, our NRT2s are in there. Um, so what's in that cluster? Well, they're dominated by uh, lipid biosynthesis network genes. At, at first, we were a bit at a loss to explain that, but uh, there's lots of uh, work out there that shows the importance of, uh, you know, that lipid pathways in regulating uh, transport. So we're, we're now following that up, and uh, we're um, validating this with uh, other experiments. Uh, Luke, that's here in the audience, uh, his PhD was based on doing it on a finite time scale and uh, looking at uh, a range of different perturbations to try and um, validate uh, uh, the genes that we've got. Um, we've also got uh, a lot of Arabidopsis knockouts that uh, we're phenotyping, and uh, we've got maize and wheat overexpression lines to try and see uh, what the effect uh, manipulating these genes has on uptake. So the take-home message from that, the most important things for, from my perspective are that uh, you know, the uptake system is really dynamic across the life cycle. Um, you know, even under steady state conditions, I mean, that, uh, we maintain the nitrate concentrations really accurately. And uh, w even under steady state conditions, you had major responses of the plant. And it's all based on demand and uh, the way that the plant was changing its root to shoot ratio as it grew. So the plant drops its root to shoot ratio, uh, it has less root there, it has to ramp up its uptake to meet demand. When it does that, it has an oversupply and um, then uh, ramps down again. Um, that nitrate responsive transcription is extensive, but only at specific time points. And uh, you know, the NRT2s are key to responding to demand and supply of nitrate. Even at higher concentrations, they're the ones that are responding, not the low affinity transporters. Um, and uh, you know, we're really interested in the cluster of genes that uh, are um, you know, being co-expressed with those NRT2s. So we've done a lot of other work uh, apart from this. Um, we've done some fine time scale. So uh, in that experiment, it was every two days. We've uh, looked at uh, a finer time scale than that. We've gone to the stage of looking at uh, diurnal variation, and uh, we're just writing up the paper for that now, and uh, that uh, is what I was talking before about our model being more complicated. We've also looked at the primary nitrate response. That's another experiment that Luke did. Um, so much of uh, the nitrogen literature is based on the primary nitrate response, where you starve a plant and then resupply it uh, with nitrate. Um, and you know, most of the, well, a lot of the nitrate transport community can't relate to steady state experiments because they're so used to, uh, they can only put it in context of that primary nitrate response. So we did that to be able to put it in context. Um, and as I said, we've done, uh, we've got RNA-seq analysis that uh, we got uh, last Friday delivered to us. So we're, we're working on that. We've also done uh, some diversity set uh, work um, with maize. So we looked at uh, initially 100 and 20 lines uh, for pre 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 preliminary analysis, and then we settled down on a, a bunch of 30 maize lines, and in that we found that, uh, again, it was the NRT2s that uh, were important in uh, being able to maintain nitrogen supply uh, when nitrogen was short. Uh, we've been looking into the regulatory pathways with transgenics and trying to uh, work with the systems biologists to uh, try and understand what's going on, what are the key genes. We've also looked at, uh, you know, for us, a good model is when the plants, when the, the seedling has germinated, it's using its uh, maternal nitrogen um, stores. 
and uh, we're keen to know, you know, what is turned on when that plant has to capture nitrogen from outside, when it first uh, sets up that uh, nitrate transport system. Because if we can understand that, we think we've got a better understanding of uh, the system. And we've also looked at uh, ammonium uptake, as I said before, because it's generally ignored. People just talk about nitrate, but uh, even though it's only 10%, it does have a big effect on growth, much bigger than uh, you suggest from 10%. Uh, and we've also uh, been looking at uh, wheat and barley uh, nitrate uptake, because uh, you know, maize is not a big crop in uh, southern Australia. It's a beautiful model for us, but uh, it's not a major crop that's going to interest the GRDC. So part two of the seminar is phenotyping differences in nitrogen response. So we've moved across to wheat, but uh, trying to understand the responses of uh, wheat isn't that simple. I mean, the hydroponic stuff that we've done has shown you know, how sensitive the system is. So uh, if we're transitioning to uh, um, wheat and trying to phenotype these transgenic plants we've got, you know, how do we do that? Um, it's not uh, a simple thing. So this is again collaborating with uh, ACPFG and uh, this is based at uh, the Plant Accelerator in Adelaide. So why is uh, nitrogen insufficiency hard to phenotype? Well, environment has a major impact on NUE, um, both water availability, um, you know, but uh, how much and where. Um, nitrate moves fairly freely in wet soils, but uh, when the soil dries, you then uh, lose that uh, mobility. Uh, soil type has a big impact, temperature, and uh, also disease. There was a, a major initiative in the 1980s in South Australia looking at uh, um, phenotyping NUE, and uh, it turned out after you know, about four years of trials that uh, they had uh, root diseases <coughs> compromising their performance because, you know, the, the roots had just been chopped off and, uh, you know, the results were meaningless. And, uh, you know, one of the people involved in that, when I was talking to him, said, I'm never going near nitrogen again, it's just too hard. But, uh, you know, these days we can, um, you know, work out what uh, root diseases are there and deal with that, but it's certainly uh, an issue. Um, management, again, has a major impact on NUE. Uh, if you look at uh, how nitrogen is used throughout uh, Australia, it varies. If you look internationally, it's, uh, there's massive variation in how nitrogen is applied. Australian farmers are fairly good at uh, applying nitrogen. Um, you know, they're miserly and uh, they'll try and match uh, the nitrogen supply to the demand of the plant and uh, to, the, uh, to the weather that uh, they've got in that season because uh, they don't want to have too much biomass that they can't uh, convert into grain. And that's not uh, the same issue that you get uh, in Europe, where you don't generally have those dry finishes that we have here. So all of that's going to be taken into account when you uh, are phenotyping. Um, you know, the, the dominant paradigm is that, uh, you know, field trials are best. Yeah, that's always the case. You know, just put it into the field. But it, it's not that easy. I mean, um, as I said before, there's that... Uh, that E by M uh, interaction um, that uh, makes it difficult. I mean, I've got uh, a colleague in uh, the UK that's been looking at a, a, a diversity set and uh, he's run those trials for 10 years now in the one location um, and he's now happy with the results, but uh, it's taken 10 years for him to get that uh, right, which uh, you know, is just not feasible. And uh, we've got another issue in terms of, you know, not all germplasm can go into the field at multiple locations over multiple years. You can't shove a large uh, population into the field at uh, a multiple sites over multiple years. Um, and in terms of GM, GM material, you just can't do that. Um, in South Australia, we've got uh, an ag minister that uh, is heavily anti-GM, so it, uh, you know, the field trials that we've had have been very limited, all hand sewn and just not realistic. Um, so, we think controlled, controlled environments have a role. I mean, you've got uh, a fair ability to control the environment and uh, what you can't control, you can at least monitor really well. Um, you've got high resolution measurements of growth and uh, ideally they're repeatable. We can uh, um, do the experiments and uh, control a lot of the environment. 
However, it's still got to be relevant to field performance. There's no point to, in doing this. We can't sell it to, to the breeders or to the funding agencies if we can't show that it uh, relates to field performance. So, I mean, the, the system that we've got uh, in Adelaide is uh, it's a, a non-destructive phenotyping platform, and I'll show you a bit more about it later. But uh, in the past, it's been used to uh, look at uh, response to water deficits, and it's picked up relatively subtle differences between germplasm for um, their response to water deficit. Um, that was with uh, wheat, and uh, this is with sorghum. It, uh, it, it really identified beautifully uh, differences in um, their response to water deficit. It didn't pick up differences in nitrogen uptake, but these didn't appear to have any differences in nitrogen uptake. But you can see that uh, the different coloured lines there, it certainly distinguished the, the nitrogen response quite well. And so we wanted to use the same approach uh, for our wheat work in nitrogen response. So the idea was that uh, we wanted to have it field validated. Uh, the breeders that we work with, uh, AGT, have been doing nitrogen response trials uh, in, you know, generally they do about four environments per year. They've done that for a number of years with a large germplasm set. You know, we, we aim to use that, uh, those field results, to, to validate our controlled environment work. Um, and ideally find out, you know, what in the, the glass house we can relate to the field. So the goal was to uh, be able to identify uh, nitrogen efficient genotypes, uh, also nitrogen responsive genotypes. So in terms of nitrogen efficient, we mean those that can grow well on low N. Uh, in terms of nitrogen responsive, those that when you give them more N will grow. Um, ideally, we want to be able to quantify differences in uh, nitrogen uptake. And again, um, to be able to have parameters in the um, controlled environment we can relate to the field and uh, you know, ideally have a, a robust method for phenotyping NUE parameters. So this is the, the experiment I'm going to describe to you today. Uh, this, was, uh, this is part of our phenotyping platform. Uh, there's 600 pot capacity in this. This is one of our smart houses. It's a Lemnotech-based uh, platform. Um, the plants are grown in the glass house. They're then sent out to each day, or in this case every second day, and they're water to weight and uh, imaged. And uh, based on the image analysis, we then get the biomass. Uh, they were small pots. Uh, we have to have clay in that, uh, in that soil mix because without the clay, the, the soil just, uh, the water goes down too quickly and uh, they're mulched to reduce uh, evapor evaporation. We had four water regimes and three nitrogen treatments and uh, they grew on the system from 24 to 76 days and then in a normal glass house to maturity so we could get the, the grain yield. So these were the water treatments we had. You know, as I said before, water has a huge impact on uh, nitrogen uptake and we tried to capture that in this experiment. So uh, we had one treatment that was well watered, uh, then uh, a water deficit and then rewatered, uh, and that's sort of from flowering and then uh, water deficit all the way, and then well watered initially, and then water deficit. And when I say well watered, uh, they're not that well watered. Because we can control the water quite well, we're watering to weight all the time, we can uh, have a well watered that's not uh, saturated. So often with uh, you know, glass house studies, you know, people are you know, watering well, but uh, it's just saturating. And uh, we think that that uh, you know, compromises the results somewhat. So our well watered isn't that well watered. So that's the plants uh, as they're growing in the experiment, another shot of that. Um, in terms of uh, monitoring the environment, in this case we just had one sensor here, but uh, our statisticians uh, are treating it like a, a field trial. So they're using spatial analysis in that. And uh, based on their advice, we've now got uh, six uh, environmental monitors. We've got a wireless sensor network. So we've got uh, PAR, um, temperature and humidity at six points uh, in that uh, glass house. And that's uh, what uh, they look like as they grow. So these are the images that we're getting from our R RGB camera. 
and the video is going to work because we tested it. Yes. So that's the four, four different treatments there. And uh, <laughs> it was going to work. Oh, it went all the way? Yeah. OK. No, it's not going all the way. It's meant to, it's meant to go to heading. Regardless, it's not that important. But uh, the main thing is that uh, the way the system works, for those that don't know, is that uh, you've got a camera that's taking a, an image from here, and then uh, we rotate the plant 90 degrees, take another image, and then we've got a camera from above that's uh, taking a top view. And based on uh, the image analysis, looking at the number of green pixels there, we can fairly, ac fairly accurately measure the biomass. And we've validated that uh, by doing destructive harvests. So we've got good correlations for wheat uh, with fresh weight, dry weight, and uh, the surface area. We're just improving the system now so that uh, instead of just having uh, the total biomass, we can actually, certainly early on, we can track uh, the individual uh, leaf growth. the wrong, I changed it, damn. So these are the grain weight results from that experiment. So these are just two wheat lines. You can see that uh, we've got the three nitrogen levels here. We've got a nitrogen response. That uh, response is lower at, uh, um, with high drought uh, than you get uh, when you're well watered. And uh, in terms of the grain yield, um, the uh, the, the green line here are those plants that were well watered and then had water deficit. And uh, so they didn't, uh, even though they had, even though they had higher biomass, so that's the same plants, when you look at the grain yield, uh, they couldn't convert that biomass into um, uh, actual yield. So uh, that was the grain yield and this is the, the maximum shoot projected area. So that's that number of pixels you get from the three images. And uh, it looks fairly similar to those uh, grain yield results, um, apart from that difference in uh, uh, what you actually harvest. Um, but this is just the, the maximum shoot projected area. We've got a lot more information than that, though. So that was the maximum projected area. So that's up here. But uh, you know, as you can see there, you've got uh, you know, 26 different data points describing the growth of those plants uh, over time. So this is for one wheat plant. You've got uh, well watered, water deficit, well watered, water deficit all the way, and then those plants that were well watered, then water deficit. You can see the, the nitrogen responses there. So you lose the nitrogen response with this genotype at, uh, um, when it's droughted. Uh, and then in these plants here, um, when you rewater them, you then you gain back that, uh, that nitrogen response to the second nitrogen treatment. So after that period of maximum growth, it then comes down. That's because you've got senescence of the older leaves. So that was just one variety there. But, uh, you know, if you compare... Uh, the individuals, you can see the genotypic differences that we've got. And this is, uh, this is elite germplasm, so we weren't sure that we'd get much variation. But uh, these were the plants that were well watered with high nitrogen, and you can see the differences you've got there. That's just five of the ten lines. Uh, again, uh, with the drought then well watered, you can see the, the differences you're getting between the germplasm, and likewise with uh, the drought at high nitrogen. So we're interested in uh, what uh, those uh, you know, genotyp genotypic responses uh, reflect. So this is just uh, the scatter plots for the 10 different varieties in this experiment. And uh, it's the grain yield on the x-axis and that the, the biomass on uh, the y-axis. So that's the maximum biomass. And uh, you know, there's a good correlation between um, the, the two. Uh, but that depends on the water treatment. So when plants have, uh, um, w you know, they have the water taken away from them uh, in the second part of growth, they've got, uh, you know, less grain to show for it. The plants that were droughted then well watered, they have more grain than you'd expect. 
So uh, we've got a few analysis challenges there. I mean, there hasn't been that many publications out using uh, these sort of systems. I mean, you've got so much, uh, so many data points there. I mean, you know, we've found 16 different ways to describe uh, those growth curves, and we're working with the statisticians to, to distinguish differences between them. And that's just with the RGB images. We've got uh, the RGB, we've got uh, um, near infrared, and we've got uh, steady state fluorescence. Um, so, you know, that's a lot more. Uh, we've also got, uh, you know, the growth habit. Um, so, you know, we've got various ways of uh, describing the shoot architecture. And uh, we've also got uh, the color classifications, you know, so we can pick up when the plant is uh, removing um, nitrogen from the old leaves and putting it into the young leaves. And then we've got all the conventional measures, you know, harvest index, nitrogen uptake, um, et cetera, and the water use. So we've got so much data there, it's just making sense of that. You know, it's that 26 different data points we've got uh, for growth. Um, and then we've got to try and relate that to their field performance. And uh, when we first uh, discussed this with the statisticians, they just uh, laughed at us. But uh, we're working on that now. But, uh, you know, the conventional statistical approach has a limit. And uh, we've got, uh, we collaborate uh, with uh, um, the Australian Centre for Visual Technologies for our, our image analysis work. And uh, they use machine learning for that. And uh, they're really keen that, uh, they can make something of our results that uh, conventional statistics just won't do. So uh, we've given them the data and uh, they're now, have got a student playing with that and hopefully we'll get something out of that. We've replicated the experiment because, uh, you know, if we can't repeat it in the controlled environment, then we can just stop now. Um, you know, we want to be able to see those same responses. We've included more germplasm in the next experiment. Uh, so instead of 10 lines and uh, four water treatments, we've now got uh, 20 lines because the, the breeders have incorporated more lines into their field trials. Um, you know, we've got uh, nitrogen uptake and we've got some proxies for um, nitrogen uptake, but we really want to, uh, oh, we've got some proxies for nitrogen in the tissues, but uh, we really want to be able to measure nitrogen accurately. So we've got a student that uh, is currently in France um, working up a, a field spec technique, which is a, you know, a handheld um, hyperspectral camera pretty much with a leaf clip that uh, has for during week been used to uh, really accurately measure the nitrogen content in the leaves. So we want to be able to use that to monitor nitrogen uptake over time. Uh, and we've got a hyperspec that's coming into our system in the middle of the year and uh, we want to use the same principle to be able to non-destructively measure the nitrogen in the plant over time. So in the same way we have our RGB imaging, we'll have the hyperspec imaging um, and uh, we'll be able to, in theory, uh, measure the nitrogen in the plant, in the different components of the plant over time and get an idea of the dynamics. But uh, if anyone knows uh, the amount of data that comes from a hyperspectral camera, it's not that simple. And uh, we're dealing with a, a 3D structure, which makes it even harder. But, uh, you know, we've got some good results thus far in terms of distinguishing germplasm. So we're, we're putting our transgenics through the system next. And uh, later this year, we're putting through uh, a population to try and understand a bit more about the genetics underlying the differences that we're seeing. So, you know, the non-destructive method uh, is revealing genotypic variation. Uh, in the nitrogen response. Um, the genotypes differed in nitrogen response and water availability, or their response to water availability. Um, and, uh, you know, analysis of the data set is challenging but could be rewarding. And uh, I've said the right treatments are important uh, because, uh, you know, if you look at the stuff that we've done, we've been applying, we know this soil well, we know the response to uh, the amount of nitrogen we've put in there, but that's all the nitrogen up front. And that's not what the farmers are doing. So uh, the next step is that uh, we incorporate some nitrogen management into those experiments. So lastly, I want to talk a bit about uh, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility. Um, so the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility is, uh, or we aim to uh, provide phenotyping capacity to the Australian plant science community. It's uh, a fairly big aim. 
Uh, at the moment, we've got uh, the Plant Accelerator in Adelaide and uh, the High Resolution Plant Phenomic Centre in Canberra, which is uh, a combination of CSIRO and uh, the ANU. So we're funded through uh, NCRIS, which is the National Collaborative Infrastructure Research Scheme, which uh, Christopher Pine fixed uh, last year. Um, uh, and uh, after causing us a bit of grief in terms of funding, but uh, the funding was fixed and it, uh, the government is committed to funding NCRIS for in the long term. So where they've put forward a plan for 10 years funding of uh, NCRIS facilities. Um, it's open access, but uh, access does involve cost. <coughs> That's part of the, the NCRIS mandate is that, uh, you know, we've got to cost the projects and charge for them. Um, you know, this, we can do projects and we have done projects as full service. So we have uh, people that uh, just send us the seed, tell us exactly what to do, and we do that. But uh, our ideal is that uh, people come and do experiments with us. So that's either in Canberra or in Adelaide, people coming to, to run an experiment and uh, you know, add value to what uh, we're already doing. Uh, we've got, uh, apart from just a lot of equipment, We've got a lot of expertise in, uh, you know, a lot of aspects of uh, plant phenotyping that uh, can be utilised. So, uh, you know, it's, this is from, um, you know, a whole range of scales from, uh, you know, the controlled environment on model plants to the field. Uh, in terms of the model plants, there's an example of that. This is... Uh, Justin Borowitz's uh, spectral phenoclimatron, uh, which apart from having a fabulous name, uh, um, is really good if you're looking at light quality. So uh, you've got programmable LEDs there. So I think in this one you've got uh, six different wavelengths. So you can uh, pretty much mimic any light quality that you get anywhere in the world. And uh, in this case, they're, looking, they're using that to see how uh, different genotypes would perform under uh, different light regimes that you get in different locations around the world. Uh, we've got uh, the tray scan, which is a similar thing that uh, there's one at uh, ANU and CSIRO, so that's uh, um, high throughput phenotyping of model plants, so it can be used for what has been used for Arabidopsis and for uh, Brachypodium, but uh, it's for small plants. Um, plant scan is something that uh, CSIRO have developed, which is uh, high resolution phenotyping of individual plants. Uh, you've got beautiful 3D reconstructions. Uh, they've been tracking leaves uh, over time for, um, for since the start of setting up the system. Uh, we've got uh, our system in Adelaide. So uh, I showed you one of the smart houses that was uh, 600 pot capacity. We've actually got four of those. And uh, it's all, you can do GM in all of them but uh, half of the capacity is uh, also quarantine approved. So uh, we have a lot of uh, situations where people bring in populations from uh, overseas. Instead of having to grow them up, we can, uh, and then do the experiments, we can do the experiments with the seed that's been given to us, um, which has huge advantages because if you've got uh, uniform seed quality that uh, you want to you know, test a, a population, you don't want to have to grow it up in pots uh, in a quarantine glasshouse. Uh, so as I said, we've got uh, the RGB, NIR, and uh, steady state fluorescence that uh, are the main ones we're using. And uh, you know, as of uh, midway through the year, we'll have uh, a hyperspectral system as well. Uh, we've got a, a, a gravimetric system, which is uh, similar to what uh, is, uh, Graham's got here in Queensland. Uh, it's in a glass house. We've got uh, good control over um, the watering of those, and uh, we've recently included uh, um, LED lighting to sort of give uniform lighting uh, throughout the year to that. Uh, we've got uh, a 3D laser scanner that uh, you know is good because you know not everything can go onto the big system. <coughs> There's a lot of people that are growing plants in the glass in our glass houses that. Uh, just when I get an idea of the biomass non-destructively, and for that uh, we've got that uh, 3D laser scanner, which is really simple to use and uh, gives you the basic parameters uh, of growth. Um, so I've put a lot of time into uh, developing uh, the phenomenal light. Uh, you've got uh, similar ones here in Queensland. Uh, they're now currently trying to deploy those uh, around Australia. 
we'd be very happy because there's a lot of demand for that. People are building their own, but uh, you know, ideally we want uh, you know cheap solutions that uh, everyone can have without having to you know develop the capacity in house. Uh, Sire have also uh, got uh, a Cropatron. So uh, this is based on the idea that uh, you know we want to have more than just single plants in pots. In this case, you've got uh, large crates, and uh, you know you have a lot more like you've got in the field. And they've got a, a range of different uh, um, imaging of those uh, plants. Uh, so I've also been playing a lot with uh, field sensors. Um, you know, characterising the environment uh, is really important. One of the things they've developed uh, is uh, on the top left that canopy temperature. So the Arja crop system. So this is all uh, based on mobile phone technology. So you can track the canopy temperature of uh, an individual plot uh, over time. Um, now, I said before that uh, people, uh, um, you know, you've got to come to Adelaide or Canberra to do stuff, and that is an issue. And we want to get people using the system from uh, all around Australia. Um, it's, uh, we have... Uh, we almost have more people using the Plant Accelerator from overseas than uh, we do from uh, around Australia, um, which uh, is a pain for us. We want to, to have more people doing experiments there. And not just uh, doing experiments there, but doing really good experiments. You know, we've got uh, people using the systems, but uh, we want uh, you know, to get the maximum impact out uh, of the systems that we've got. So we've got a range of ways of encouraging that. Um, travel grants, you know, that issue of it uh, being in Adelaide or in Canberra, um, you can apply for a travel grant to uh, go to Adelaide to uh, do your experiment. Um, for postgrad students, I mean, we really want to work with students. It's ideal. They come to Adelaide, spend, uh, you know, a month and do an experiment with us, and uh, they can add value <coughs> to what uh, we're normally doing. So we've had some really good uh, students come and do experiments with us and uh, they can get a travel grant uh, as part of that. And the other thing there is the phenomics infrastructure for excellence in plant science, the, the PEEP scheme. I apologise profusely for the name. We uh, um and art on that, uh, and I eventually gave up. But uh, that scheme is to... Uh, you can do large experiments. I think the, the, the amount that you can get for a single experiment is uh, $50,000, which is a lot of phenotyping. And uh, with that, we want to be able to do experiments that uh, have high impact. So what uh, experiments can people come up with that would really use the system um, or the systems that we've got to their best? And uh, <coughs> as part of that, uh, you know, we can have the travel grants as well. But uh, if anyone's interested in using the system, the cost is, uh, you know, prohibitive, then uh, please look at that. Um, we've got, uh, we've had a round of that already and uh, we've got another round coming up uh, in the middle of the year. Um, you know, ideally it uh, is uh, for an international collaboration or, uh, you know, even just multiple groups in Australia doing that. Uh, but again, it's, uh, you know, something that's going to have a high impact. An issue that we've got with uh, the users of the systems is that uh, industry are happy to pay the money. They've got the money to pay for it. So we get a lot of industry experiments. Uh, we get a lot of GRDC experiments. Um, you know, in my case, I pay for my experiments through uh, an ARC linkage. But what we're missing is, you know, the things like discovery projects. You know, if you've got an ARC discovery, if you can get uh, money for a postdoc and then five thousand a year in operating, then that's you're lucky. But uh, you know, hopefully, if you know people can come up with a good experiment, they can use us uh, as part of that. Um, in terms of the pilot projects, I mean, we do run a lot of pilot projects. So if you've got an idea for an experiment that uh, could use any of the phenotyping capacity that we've got, then uh, you know, we can do pilot experiments that won't be any cost, just proof of concept stuff. But uh, you know, if you've got uh, any interest, then have a look at our website and, uh, or talk to us about uh, what's available. Um, Again, you know, we are a resource of phenotyping, so that can just be in terms of uh, advice. I mean, we've got a lot of experience with protocols and pipelines, um, advice on equipment. There's a lot of people out there selling stuff, and uh, you know, we've learnt that uh, you know, 
it doesn't always do what uh, it's been told to do. Um, and uh, we've also created a lot of equipment uh, and have learnt a lot. So, you know, um, a big part of uh, us delivering phenotyping capacity is also uh, giving advice uh, in terms of commissioning equipment there. Um, that uh, we've, uh, we've given plenty of advice on that in the past because uh, commissioning of equipment uh, is, uh, you know, challenging. Uh, and we're also, as part of uh, the APPF, we're supporting the development of uh, Plant Phenomics Australia, which is trying to uh, get together, um, you know, people with uh, phenotyping experience. A lot of people uh, think about phenomics as being a new thing, but uh, it's not at all. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, we've been doing phenomics uh, since the start of plant science. Just measuring the height of a plant is, uh, you know, phenomics. You're phenotyping it. Uh, so people have got a vast uh, amount of experience in terms of uh, phenomics, and uh, we want to be able to tap that and, uh, you know, make it easier for people to, that are getting into it. Uh, I just want to acknowledge people. There's a, a whole range of people that uh, uh, have been involved with the, uh, the nitrogen uptake work. And uh, that's from uh, within ACPFG, University of Melbourne, University of Western Australia, um, AGT and uh, DuPont in the US. And in terms of the phenotyping, um, we've got uh, the accelerated people, we've got statisticians and again uh, our commercial collaborators. So thank you. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, so the, the initial... You had, a, you had a dip in quite a marked dip in both high and low nitrate in uptake. Yeah, so what uh, we looked at the growth of, of the roots and the shoots and uh, the total uptake there, and as I was saying before, um, the plant's rapidly dropping the size of its roots. So its root-to-shoot ratio changes dramatically, and uh, then you get to the point where you need to ramp up uptake. And so they do that. And then uh, they oversupply because there's no way. I mean, when you're trying to coordinate, um, you know, shoot levels of nitrogen, it's you've got a lag phase there. So what we think is doing is that uh, they're ramping up uptake uh, to cope with the the dropping um, root size, and then they oversupply, and then they uh, then have to shut everything down because uh, uptake is uh, more than they require. So that's what we think is going on there. Toxicity. Uh, no, but uh, it, uh, it's hard to get nitrogen toxicity. Um, but uh, in this case, we think it's just the, the plant doesn't want to, to mess with its carbon to nitrogen ratios. It's uh, because, you know, being a macro new. It goes back to the 30s, C to N ratio story about development. Yeah, so we've got, uh, I mean, we're working on the, there's been a lot more work done with uh, um, carbon partitioning in the plant and uh, how that's regulated and we're using that to try and understand what's going on in terms of nitrogen because we think it's, uh, it's closely tied to that. And that then leads on to uh, the diurnal work that we've been doing. So when I said it's a lot more complicated, um, you know, we're seeing massive variation uh, diurnally and we're trying to incorporate that diurnal variation which seems very much like the uh, the way that the carbon changes in a plant uh, um, diurnally to uh, that uh, longer-term model of nitrate uptake regulation. Mm. Yeah, With regard to that issue, um, do you think that pot size could have any, in, any impact? Particularly as you're uh, increasing size, uh, volume being explored by the root system is quite... Yes, uh, it's a really important point. And uh, we uh, did an experiment last year on our gravimetric system looking at uh, four different pot sizes, ranging from those small 2.5 litre pots to uh, 12 litre pots. So uh, we've got uh, drought tolerant and intolerant uh, wheat varieties, and uh, we've grown them uh, under, under water deficit and uh, well watered. Um, to harvest to try and quantify that. So, uh, I mean, the, 
the dominant paradigm is that, uh, oh, you need bigger pots, but uh, um, you know, it's not uh, as simple as that. I mean, there's been a few papers that have been put out that have said, oh, it didn't show up at, uh, with small pot sizes, but uh, in one case, they were you know, saying it was a 50 gram pot didn't relate to field performance, and that's really clear. But I think there's a threshold there because plants in the field don't get access to 20 kilograms of soil. You know, um, in a plant in a farmer's paddock, is a, you know, it's still limited in terms of its uh, amount of soil it can access. So uh, I recognise that's an issue, and we're trying to uh, validate that now. Um, I just spoke to the technician yesterday and uh, you know, tried to hurry her up on uh, threshing the, the heads that we've got, but uh, understandably she's not that keen and uh, is procrastinating. Um, I've just got one question myself. I was very interested to see that the demand was a big driver in here in terms of in uptake, and that um, gels with how we, how we handle nitrogen in diamond crop models. It's really very much based on the principle of the demand. Um, the, the, the connection then is back to this projected leaf area or projected area. So a lot of the differences, you're seeing huge differences in projected area in these treatments. And that is then changing demand um, and is confounding a lot of the results you're seeing. Uh, so just, and you mentioned the issue about data analysis. Being, being a, you, you, you've got a data storm, um, and you've got a lot of differences among your treatments in basic things like projected area. Um, I'm just a bit concerned that machine learning is probably even dumber than statistics. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there some other way you're thinking of attack on this? Uh, well, as I mentioned to you earlier, I mean, modelling. We've got to incorporate modelling into what we're doing. Um, just uh, if we're going to have a machine learning approach, we need to, to guide that approach. It can't just be a, you know, a dumb, a completely dumb approach. But if we can guide that, um, I think we can make sense of it. But it can't be just completely, you know, like a Google approach. But if we combine, you know, if we can have an idea of what we're looking for and, you know, force the machine learning approach uh, to follow what we know, because we do know a lot about uh, what's going on. So if we can use that, then uh, that'd be ideal. Thanks, Trevor. Have the, um, the insights that you found in terms of the life cycle changes in end uptake and the sensitivity to the level of nitrogen in the soil. I think if it's low, it switches on the, the, um, the NRT2s. The NRT2s. Does that tell you anything about optimising the timing of applications in the field different to what the farmers are doing through pragmatic experience? I mean, is it better to have the plants a bit hungry Um, it, uh, it's, it, uh, I was a bit, uh, overwhelmed at one point trying to relate to what farms are doing. Um, that got worse when I recognised that, uh, it varies wherever you are. I mean, you know, the, I've got a farmer mate on the Air Peninsula in South Australia and, uh, he's brilliant with nitrogen and they're really good in terms of adopting technology. I mean, they've got... They had, you know, leaf uh, sap measurements of nitrate early on. Um, they're getting into drones now. Um, but so much of it is just based on him looking at their crop and saying, right, we need nitrogen now. He's calibrated his views of that, um, you know, with uh, all these this different technology, but he's just, he knows how these, what these plants need. And, you know, that's why he's doing, you know, four to five nitrogen additions a year. 
And it's like, oh, okay, that's a bit different to what uh, we've, we've done in our experiment with a steady state um, um, measurement, a, a steady state um, supply of nitrate. Um, in terms of uh, our field trials with the breeders, they shoved all the nitrogen on up front. So they're looking at nitrogen response of these cultivars, but they shoved the nitrogen up front because if they shoved it on th throughout the season, it made it too complex to, anal to analyse. And we've gotten them to change that now, so they're now looking at uh, different additions, but it's still, you know, only two additions. The farmers are doing a lot more. Um, you've got the scenarios in uh, Western Australia where you need plants that have their roots down really quickly to catch the nitrate before it uh, goes through the, the deep sandy soils. Here you've got uh, the deep clays and uh, you know, the, the roots again have to get down fast. So there's so many different scenarios, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. So I don't really think we can apply uh, directly what uh, we're doing to the field because there's so many different fields. So what uh, I'm keen on doing at the moment, and um, I discussed that uh, already today, is that uh, just trying to get a summary of all the different nitrogen scenarios that uh, we've got in terms of management and environment so that uh, then we can start to think about what the ideotype is that we need for these different environments. But uh, at the moment though, it's to, to try and relate what we've got uh, here, which like, oh yes, we can use that. And it's like, well, there's so many different uh, scenarios in terms of nitrogen supply that uh, we're trying to, to match that information to that uh, I'm overwhelmed. In theory, yes. Good place to wrap things up. What, me being overwhelmed? We're all being <laughs> overwhelmed, I think, in connecting these things to the problems. But, uh, but it's where it's going to go. So thank you very much for attendance, and please join me in thanking.